in 2020, the world was reeling. Medical facilities were in shock. Medical staff were exhausted. There were mass graves in New York. Death was everywhere. However, by the end of 2020, it was apparent that a vaccine would be developed. So the question that we want to ask them is, how do we fight contagious disease? We will have to know what it is and how our bodies can fight it. The story that I want to tell is the story of the science of vaccines, just a tiny fragment of the huge story of vaccine science in our lives. People have expressed a fear that the vaccine was developed too rapidly. However, the vaccine that we have today is the result of basic research that dates back at least 200 years, maybe 400. To make a vaccine, we have to understand what a virus is, how we fight a virus, and what we need to make a vaccine. So I what I want to tell you is, very briefly, a history of our learning. It's the story of many scientists of many countries and many disciplines and how we work together to solve a problem. So first, we have to ask, what is a viral disease? Let's consider contagious diseases. The first and best known is plague. Plague is a bacterial, not a viral disease, but it illustrates the point. Plague first appeared in Europe in the seventh century and then retur returned in the 12th century, coming from East Asia, reaching Turkey, from Turkey to Venice, and then spreading into the rest of Europe, where it eventually killed one third of Europeans. Plague statues throughout the cities of Eastern Europe commemorate the period. Less discussed and less remembered is the fact that late in the plague period, Europeans reached the New World, where they brought to the indigenous people smallpox, flu, tuberculosis, and the common gold. In some areas, 90% of the native population died. The first rational defense against contagious disease was quarantine. First proposed by Avicenna in the 10th century, issued as a governmental edict in Dubrovnik in the 14th century, it was finally extended in 1448 in Venice to 40 days for incoming vessels, giving us the term quarantine. This defense has persisted to the present day. I remember from my childhood quarantine signs uh, for chickenpox, scarlet fever, influenza, smallpox, measles, mumps, and diphtheria. The second defense was immunization. By the early 1600s, the Chinese had recognized that a mild dermal case of smallpox would prevent the more severe systemic form. This idea reached Turkey, perhaps coming via Mongols in the 17th century, and it reached England by the 18th century. Physicians there realized that a prior case of cowpox would prevent smallpox, and in 1780, Jenner proposed deliberately infecting people with cowpox. The term vaccination in English and other languages comes from the Latin word for cow. <clears throat> A rational attempt to make vaccine came in the mid 20th century. Polio vaccine was introduced in the United States in 1952. The result was spectacular. Polio fell from 60,000 cases per year to effectively zero within the next few years. There's an important lesson to be learned here, and that is the importance of science to this endeavor. Most people know the names of Jonas Salk and Albert Sabin, the developers of the first two polio vaccines. But in 1954, a Nobel Prize was awarded for the achievement not to Salk and Sabin, but to John Enders, Thomas Weller, and Frederick Robbins. Why to them? Well, 
before their work, the only way to study polio was to infect a monkey and uh, to study uh, polio in the dying monkey. Enders and his team showed that polio could be grown in large amounts in cultured cells uh, and then uh, taken from the kidney of a green monkey. Once the virus could be cultured, it was relatively straightforward to kill or weaken the virus and make it suitable for vaccination. This story emphasizes the role of basic science in medicine. Polio is caused by a virus. So what is a virus? The existence of viruses was proposed, even though they could not be seen, in 1892. By 1930s, uh, using the electron microscope and X-ray crystallography, both inventions of the early 20th century, viruses were first seen. The first virus studied in 1935 was not a human pathogen, but rather a virus that infects the leaves or tobacco plants. Why? Well, that's the way that science works. We take the easiest rather than the most direct route to, towards solving the big problems. So we have known about viruses for 130 years. We need to know how our bodies fight viruses. The story of what we know about antibodies builds from the end of the 19th century and early 20th century. That of the components or the cells that produce the antibodies since the mid 1950s to 1970s. To get this information though, we needed new techniques. Since 1963, when I got my doctorate, we have increased our ability to measure approximately one billion fold. There have been many new techniques, but among those that have, were the most helpful to learning about the immune system included the use of fluorescence, which came from a study asking how it was that jellyfish glow. This led to a technique called fluorescence activated cell sorting or FACS. FACS analysis gave us the ability to identify the different types of lymphocytes and their different roles in the immune system. Using our knowledge of the immune system, we developed what we can describe as four types of vaccines. There are the whole virus types of vaccines, which include killed virus vaccines, such as the SOC vaccine against polio and the Sinovac vaccine against COVID-19. Then there are va uh, vaccines built from virus fragments, which required many advances from molecular biology. We call those types of vaccines the vector-based vaccines. And finally, the messenger RNA or mRNA vaccines. We also have monoclonal antibodies for use in emergency treatment. The vector-based vaccines include the AstraZeneca, Sputnik, and Johnson & Johnson or Janssen vaccines. To make these vaccines, we need to know what the antibodies will recognize how to present that antigen to the body. We learned what antibodies will recognize through X-ray crystallography, electron microscopy, and atomic force microscopy, as well as analytical chemistry and molecular biology. These techniques allowed us to recognize and isolate an epitope on the virus or the small portion of the virus that were particularly good for antibodies to recognize. Then we had to learn to present them, how to isolate the epitope and insert it into a harmless virus. To do this, we needed some very special techniques from molecular biology. PCR used to look for virus and amplify DNA for many purposes depends on what we learned from a study of how bacteria survive in the hot springs of Yellowstone National Park. Hybridomas used to make monoclonal antibodies date from work on the properties of cell membranes in 1973. 
Improved automation came from the space age. Basic science and engineering allowed us to get to the space race or the race to the moon. That endeavor gave us computers, robotics, and sensors that made it possible to analyze the DNA and interpret the codes. By 2000, automating sequencing was coming online. Also, in 1996, the American National Science Foundation funded a project designed to read large databases. It led to Google, and for molecular biologists, it allowed the assignment of structural meaning to the DNA codes. Today, we can read codes, predict structures, and create models of chemicals that can cross-react with and block key target sites on viruses. It would be better, though, to even avoid the uh, adenovirus by using the messenger RNA for coronavirus, but there are problems with messenger RNA. First, the protein made by messenger RNA can change shape, leading to an ineffective antigen. We can modify the genetic code, though, to stabilize the protein. <clears throat> Free in the blood, mRNA is immunogenic. Uh, gen immunogenic. Katie Carrico modified the messenger RNA to solve that, to make it not uh, immunogenic. Still, messenger RNA is extremely easily degraded, and it is water-soluble, so it cannot easily get into cells. The solution was to enclose the messenger RNA in liposomes, which are essentially microscopic soap bubbles. They were developed in 1964. However, liposomes are extremely fragile, they stick to glass, and they fuse to each other, and they leak. With the last major outbreak of Ebola, SARS-CoV-2, and Zika, an effort to make the vaccines uh, was made to, uh, based on liposomes. Liposome-based messenger RNAs were developed in 2000, but never deployed. The technique, developed by Moderna and BioNTech, was, however, perfected at that time. So what we can now do? In the 21st century, we can rapidly sequence a viral protein, allowing us to recognize the shape and function and its relationship to similar proteins. We have government online uh, services and programs to allow the analysis of data. We can, thus, we can identify the SARS-CoV-2 protein, recognize its function, modify its shape using a, a, another technique, and determine what antibodies will best interact with it and block it. We can modify the spike protein and make it more effective using what's called CRISPR-Cas9. All of the, all this depended on the basic science and history that I've just described and allowed us to get a vaccine in one year. You can say that the development of vaccines actually against COVID-19 actually go back as far as 400 years. Many of the important developments from early 19th century physics and biology really took off start, uh, from 19th century physics, and biology really took off starting around 1950. Some of the most basic steps resulted from a race to see who could be the first nation on the moon, curiosity as to why jellyfish glow and how bacteria survive in hot springs, and the National Science Foundation's interest in developing means of, of handling large databases. All of this is basic science at its most fundamental. Without it, we would have none of the miracles we see today. This is just one fragment of one of many stories. So what can we expect for the future? It's difficult to speculate more than a few years ahead because basic science change is so fast 
that it is almost impossible to imagine the future. What we do today was inconceivable when I was a student. <clears throat> Nanotubes, or micrometer-sized tubes, can hold bait molecules. For instance, to trap molecules of interest in the environment or in sputum samples. The nanotubes can be ganged into multisensors that can be read on a cell phone for diagnostic purposes. Nanobodies, miniature antibodies, are more stable and potentially more precise than our own antibodies and may be adaptable to nasal sprays, which could trap viruses uh, or within the circulatory system, likewise, to trap viruses. <clears throat> robotics, nanorobotics, big data, and artificial intelligence can be used to control prosthetic devices to explore within the body and potentially localize and destroy local cancers. Artificial intelligence can help us to understand neurological and psychiatric disease. Big data are being defined to develop specific genetic or environmental processes responsible for different types of pathology. Analytical chemistry, computerization of molecular design will enable us to build smart molecules and individualized medicine. Finally, Stem cells are technically in use already as bone marrow transplants. As we develop the skills to grow or use 3D printing to build organs, we will be able to replace organs for the moment, those that do not depend on spatial configuration, such as liver or pancreatic beta cells. What we learned from developmental biology will help us to reconstruct other organs. So one can stand in awe of the miracles of modern medicine, but those miracles came from basic science. Even the most basic of the basic sciences, including interest in ecology, animal behavior, and astronomy. Uh, I, there are many stories that I have not even begun to tell, which was part of this whole process. Modern medicine is certainly thrilling, but as I have said for many years, every day is the most exciting day to be a researcher in basic science. Thank you.